take a look around and find somebody to war eagle. It's showtime. Oh my god! Well, hello there, Auburn, Alabama, and all points around the globe where those lovely words, War Eagle, may be heard in return with joy, particularly on the hilltop crossroads of College of Magnolia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good day to you. Whenever and wherever you may be consuming this message, I hope it finds you truly well and joyful and that you are rejoicing at the prospect of far better cell coverage whilst footballing at Jordan-Hare Stadium. I see rumors that there are cell towers on the stadium now. How about that? Hello, consumers of Auburn Broadcast Transmissions, and welcome to Auburn Stuff, the variety show podcast where we discuss the philosophy of life in orange and blue, and other stuff that you may or may not find entertaining and informative, but that I certainly do. And as we take a look across the map of downloads, we also issue out, we issue forth, Warm greetings to our listeners all the way from Waterloo to Cottonwood and down here on Hilton Head Island, South Carolina, where for some reason people still come for summer vacation. And up in Duluth, Minnesota, over in Bahaba, Maine, you can't get there from here, Bahaba. Sorry about that, Mainers. You know how I love a good impression, no matter how bad I may be at it. And over in Amarillo, Texas, up in Kanab, Utah, and way down in Wellington, New Zealand. Thank you, as always, for joining the fun. It is Saturday, June 19th, the date of significance in my family. And the time is... 1.21 in the p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, making it noon 28 in the Central Time Zone. And the current weather at College of Magnolia is, well, you know. But actually, y'all are getting a break right now, as it is a bit hurricane-y in, uh, what, low 70s? So, uh... We know we all know how prone the area is to tornadic activity in times of storminess, so we certainly hope and pray that none of you uh, experience any of that kind of weather. Just hopefully a little bit of rain and a cool down. So we could all use that at all times. So enjoy the respite from the gut searing, soul crushing heat while you can. And no storms. We're sending no storm, no tornado, no violent thunderstorm vibes your way. Anyway, um, hey, remember when we discussed Sonic running out of ice cream? Well, in the continuing saga of no one wants to work anymore because of government money, i.e. taxpayer, the theft of the taxpayer... The redistribution of wealth. So, the other night, we needed something. We had worked, my wife and I, uh, we had a photo shoot. Those of you that know know what I do for a living. Um, We had a photo shoot, and in the summertime, obviously, those tend to run late when you're working outside. And so, we have to opt for something to eat later than ordinary. So, we thought... All right, let's keep it simple. There's a Subway on the way home. Let's stop by Subway and get a nice uh, flatbread, oven-roasted chicken breast, veggies, little crunch, little protein. 
good stuff, right? A little tang from the, uh, the uh, what's that sauce? The Southwest sauce. But it was not to be, alas. And why is that, you may ask? Because as the little handwritten paper sign was taped to the inside of the door, it said, new hours, nine to five. Yes, indeed, yo, ladies and gentlemen, the sandwich shop that we've all relied on for dinner for lo these many decades is apparently no longer open for dinner. They're serving breakfast at 9 o'clock in the morning for some reason. I don't know what the deal with that is. Maybe that has something to do with costs. And uh, so Subway, you can't find anybody to work after 5 o'clock, but you got enough people to work from 9 to 5. Let the listener understand and infer everything that should be inferred within. As we march forward into this post-postmodern malaise of nonsense. Anyway, um, other things of that. Hey, have any of you ever had an allergy test? I had one recently and wasn't that a heck of an experience so i am i'm 52 years old which essentially means that i am i'm not in my 20s i got some money i'm not poor um i have decent insurance and so those things that used to just suffer through and ignore, deal with, you know, go ahead and get those things looked at while you got the resources, right? So, like probably a good many of you, I've suffered from seasonal allergies. I didn't know what. I just figured everybody sneezes when it's pollen in the spring. Pine and grass and all that good stuff. Um, So I thought, well... Let's go ahead and take advantage of the resources that you do currently have and figure out just what in the hell exactly is taking you down every spring. It's not, you know, for me, it's 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 not a completely debilitating condition because it, it doesn't affect me every day. But when it does, it absolutely takes me out. I will 100% completely lose a day. Most of my work takes place with client interaction and I can't function when I got snot dripping out of me, sneezing, hacking, blowing my nose. No one wants to be around that. And the only cure, once that happens, once the first bracket of sneezes braces my body, that's it. There's, there's no going back. So I have to, if I didn't preemptively, I discovered, um, uh, five or six years ago that a, uh, an over the counter, name brand uh, allergy medication really worked well for me but when I don't preemptively hit it and that first set of sneezes comes it's done and the only thing that I can do is take Benadryl and then of course I'm done for the day which sucks so anyway uh, get my referral to the allergist in my little area and uh, take the blood test the blood test comes back negative no allergies there no food allergies which is always good and i'd schedule the skin test they call it a scratch test but i wasn't scratched i was stabbed like i was in a gang fight um so the first thing you do and uh let me know if you had a different experience but you sit there, you, you, you do the first round of tests and there are, there are these two plastic apparati that each contain 20 needles with various um, contagions, as it were. Things to which you could be allergic. And they take this thing, lay it on your forearm... And mash it down so all 20 of those needles stick into you. It's not that painful. It's not, I mean, it's not a scratch, but it just kind of pokes it right in through your top layer of the old dermis there. 
They do that on both forearms. And the, the real fun part about it is you can't move for 15 minutes. You cannot move. Or it'll throw off the test. So you have to figure out um, your Zen place. And uh, so you sit there for 15 minutes and then she comes back. If you have any uh, reactions, I had four or five of those 40 that two of them were like fire ant bites and a couple of the others were just kind of minor irritation. So she comes in and circles and make circles your arm and writes on you and makes notes. And then comes part two, which is 36 individual needle sticks. And these are a bit, these range in sensation from, um, just kind of a, uh, like somebody took a piece of pine straw and, and poked your skin a little bit all the way to a bee sting. It's 36 of them all up and down one arm, all within about a one square foot area of your shoulder. And you sit there, you can move after this one. So this one takes, I think five minutes to sit there and then she comes back in and makes little circles where you uh, had a reaction and then runs all the things does her telemetry takes that little clear plastic ruler looking thing and uh, writes down what you are to what you are allergic and for me it came back interestingly as someone who grew up in the south um Timothy grass. You ever heard of that? I had to look that up. If you're more agriculturally minded, you're probably laughing at me right now, but I had to look it up and essentially it's hay. It's the grass that grows in the field that they make hay out of. And also oak, which is wonderful considering I have six trillion oak trees around me. Um, interestingly enough, not pine. Crazy. Oak, cedar, bayberry. Um, what was the other? It was four. I think there were four trees in a grass. Oak, cedar, bayberry, and uh, pecan. So, I got that going for me. And um, having 76 ostensibly uh, poisonous chemicals jammed into your body uh, in an hour one afternoon is not good for the rest of your day or a couple of days. That took me out for a while. Plus, all the vaccinations I've been getting lately, the stupid COVID thing and something else I had to get stabbed for have absolutely just worn me out. But you don't care. You got your own crap going on, don't you? So since I've been gone, a lot of shit's happened, you know, lots of recruits visiting, good, exciting news. And I kind of touched briefly last time on something I wanted to talk about, which is kind of, it goes in with this new, um, this new spectrum of, uh, things that we're dealing with all the way from a new attitude to a new way of operating, new way of looking at things, new perceptions, and it's something that's bothered me for a while, which is this this sort of general intangible uh, sense of everybody's out to get us and we can't get ahead. You know, the one step forward, two steps back thing. It's like, just when you think things are going well, here comes the story that somebody shot a squirrel in the face uh, at their dorm room or whatever, just whatever it is. Somebody murdered our trees. Somebody had their parking tickets paid for. Somebody decommitted. So, you know, it's just always something. You're never allowed to be in your your OODA loop, your cycle. We'll talk about that. Any of you military people know what I'm talking about. But in your groove without somebody kicking you out of it, knocking you off and resetting your OODA loop, which just throws off your whole balance. And doesn't that seem like it's our, it's just our lives. It's our, it's our lot in life. It's our method of our mode of being, except that it's not, 
because it's artificial. And so what I'd like to see with this new staff, this new regime, as it were, if you will, for what it's worth, is the counterattack. Not only a counterattack, but the presence of mind the, to build the infrastructure to be ahead of this game, to stay on your OODA loop, not to be constantly resetting it. By the way, OODA and OODA loop is a concept of your mindset in battle, your operation, your order of battle in that OODA, O-O-D-A, stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Attack, Act. Um, so you're in a situation, you observe. That's the first thing you do. You look around to become situationally aware. You orient, meaning you adapt your brain and your body to the space and the situation. You decide pretty straightforward you make a decision about what you are going to do and then you act you do it you execute and you stay in that loop and your your goal when you're fighting someone when you're in in battle with someone when you're in combat with someone is to knock them constantly off their oodle loop so they have to keep resetting everything it is that they do So, I, there's, there's, and I think that I see, I think I see what I want to see. And I think that this is going to get done, but I want to address this. And so, it starts with that strangely agreeable sound you're hearing emanating from the northwest corner of Sanford and Donahue. It's that. That sound is that of a machine being constructed and the shifting of the paradigm. Step by step, methodically, an enhanced version of our long lost sense of place is being restored amid the rubble of confusion. You see, the consciousness of Auburn football has been mired in the middle in confusion and arrogance of a succession of good old boys attempting to maintain a fiefdom rather than grow the imprint of the organism. And for far too long, we've been busying ourselves with winning a game when what we should have been doing was working toward winning the set of all games, the meta game. For what shall it profit a man to beat Arkansas and lose his own soul to Georgia? Sorry, small, angry digression. All right, uh, speaking of angry, I'm about to piss a bunch of you off, so strap in. On November 25th, 2017, Alabama suffered its one and only defeat of the season in a raucous Jordan-Hare Stadium. They lost their final regular season game to their arch rivals, our beloved Auburn Tigers. It did not win their division, nor did they even play for their conference championship. What a catastrophe for the vaunted water elephants, right? Was it? Well, what they did instead was take a couple of weeks off after the stinging loss, then beat Clemson and Georgia to win the national championship. And sign yet another number one recruiting class, which led to two more playoff appearances, another national championship, and more number one recruiting classes in the subsequent three years. And they did it all while dominating the headlines, talking head shows, and the entire college football media narrative. That is winning the motherfucking metagame. Oh, and just for funsies, think about it. They likely would have done the same thing in 2013 had the playoff existed then. And what have we been doing over that time? Crowing about our two wins over Bama 
while losing pretty much every other meaningful game and way too many easy games. Since that evening on the 25th of November 2017, we are... I can't... I just... I, <clears throat> Owen... Owen 4 versus <sighs> Athens Academy. We're 1 and 2 versus LSU. We're 0 and 1 versus Florida. We're 1 and 3 in bowl games with losses to Mississippi State, the worst Tennessee team in generations at home, and South Effing Carolina. And last season, we probably should have lost to Kentucky, Arkansas, and Ole Miss. But shit, man, we beat Bama again in 19. Now, don't lose your marbles on me just yet. Beating Alabama is not, not, in OT, not small thinking. But elevating that as your ultimate goal is parochial beyond measure. If in-state bragging rights is your highest form of being, then you need to take a walk in the wilderness and reevaluate your impetus. It's really genuinely irritated me my whole life to hear the following. Well, we could lose every game, but as long as we beat Bama, I'm happy. All right, Cletus. You enjoy your ramen with cut-up hot dogs while the more adventure of us grill steak that we culled from our own herd of cattle. How about you, Big Daddy? The not unabsurd part of this retrograde dynamic is that people who are actually feeding this narrative, the ones who are planting this seed of the only game that matters for Auburn is the Iron Bowl, is the Alabama machine and its countless minions across the media landscape. And while they've created a whole new system of being, we keep ladling this horse shit all over our grits. This isn't 1976 and Doug Barfield isn't walking through that door. Beating Alabama isn't the goal. Let me pause and say it again. Beating Alabama isn't the goal. It's a milestone on the path. It's a milestone on the path. And we need to come to terms with a hard truth. As long as we see victory over Bama as the mountaintop, then every single loathsome fan of that place owns a permanent residence in yo head. brings me back around to the positive. What you've been witnessing in the reports of the over-the-top positive experiences from visiting recruits is the opening salvo in a war to take back Auburn stake in the history arc of college football. Well, that sounds grand, doesn't it? Countless articles and interviews highlight glowing reviews from visiting recruits about their experience on campus and with staff and personnel. I was blown away has been the common theme. And it's not only that. This rejuvenated competence is trying its damnedest to become systemic. If only we would recognize it for what it is and allow it to flourish. There's all the new construction around campus, not just limited to the new football facility. That's not nothing, folks. Don't underestimate the impact of non-athletic facilities on the recruits and, more importantly, their parents. Those people matter. Because, you see, it's the good parents who look past sports in their desire for their kids to become elevated and more well-rounded people, regardless of what ESPN tells you. There's what Bruce Almighty has been doing with basketball. And by extension, the image and reach of the Auburn brand writ large. The value of Alan Green's hiring will be evident to history through sustained greatness. There are good things happening on the way to great things being built. People come to Auburn, 
the pe people come to Auburn, the university and the town, and they say, I love it here. I want to live here. Auburn sells itself. We've, we've known that our whole lives. But there's a serpent in the garden. And he's been slithering around for decades in an ungraspable miasma of red smoke. He's everywhere and nowhere. He knew Jimmy Cook and Hugh Culverhouse and Eric Ramsey. He knew Megan Mullen, Harvey Updike, Stephen Leith, and Jimmy Sexton. He knew Cyrus Quanjo, Reuben Foster, TJ Yeldon, D-Liner, Javion Cohen, and countless others. The Serpent isn't the grand conspiracy of a nefarious eternal wizard. It's simply the control of the narrative and the universe in which it exists. Ever wonder why it's been one step forward, two steps back for us for so long? It's not on the field. It's in the air. What you need to watch out for is the inevitable insipid undermining of our good work in the form of the insurgency to which I alluded earlier and the flanking attacks that we never see coming because we're too busy enjoying 11 a.m. kickoffs in our beat-up old running shoes. Do an archival search of articles written by supposedly <clears throat> unbiased <clears throat> journalists. Nothing slaps you in the face. Nothing reaches out and grabs your lapels and shakes you and says, hey, I'm writing for the other guy. I'm carrying water for Bama. I'm carrying water for Georgia. I'm carrying water for Notre Dame. But there's always an undertow. There's always an undertow of narrative slant that more likely than not, the writers themselves probably don't see. How about lately? Countless examples of yammering about how wonderful the last guy was and how stupid it was that he was fired. We just can't understand why the heck that guy was fired. Goodness gracious, Auburn people, don't you know your place? All you are is an 8 and 5 also, ran. It's your DNA. And you fire the booger picker who worked so very hard to make sure you stayed at that level. Who do you think you are? And what's worse, how many in our very own family agree with and support that very notion it's friggin stockholm syndrome i say enough and so apparently do alan green bruce pearl brian harson and company and here we get to the crux of the matter of all the shiny and new things at auburn i'd like to see the addition of something a little more dark and subversive a scary, invisible tier one unit of counterinsurgency operators whose only purpose is the protection of the Auburn brand through the killing of the snake in the grass. I want a team of force multipliers creating allies and assets. Are you an ally or an asset? I want a special reconnaissance and direct action team always forward gathering intelligence and cutting off threats. And I want a quick reaction force to strike against in extremist situations and ambushes. I am tired. I'm weary folks of always playing defense. Commandment nine, always play offense. You can't just do your own thing, live in your own little world, plod along, and hope everyone else abides your standards. Recognize and operate with the understanding that there is a threat. Know your enemy and understand his tactics. Stabilize your OODA loop and constantly disrupt your enemies. 
This is how you gain control of the narrative and set up stability in order to win the set of all games, the meta game. Is this you, Brad LaRondo? I don't know, I get a feeling. Are you the director? Are you the secretary of keeping it real? I wonder. You know, think about this. There's a reason no one knows that Auburn leads the series versus Alabama since 1982. Or even that Auburn leads the series since 2000. I'd kind of like for that to stop. And I think the people are in place to make that happen. Think over the horizon, Auburn family. This is going to take some time. And it's about much more than wins and losses right now. So let's let it and make it happen. Be an asset, not a liability. It is Father's Day Eve. And I want to close with a little message to the daddies, to the fathers, the papas, the pops out there. A little poem I wrote for you. And happy Father's Day to all. And here's to the real men across the span of time and geography who raise their kids. The most perfect dad is simply the one who is there. A grown-ass man works hard and plays hard. A grown-ass man can fix a leaky toilet for his wife, take his daughter shoe shopping, move furniture for his mom, and help the neighbors put up the hurricane shutters. A grown-ass man is always situationally aware. A grown-ass man knows what he doesn't know, but tries to know everything. A grown-ass man always lets the young'uns know where the line is, but lets them learn by tiptoeing over it. A grown-ass man knows that when he makes a baby, that whatever life he led before that moment is over, and that he has a new mission now. A grown-ass man will hug his son and teach his daughter how to shoot. A grown-ass man will scold his son for disrespecting his mother and scold his daughter for demanding special treatment. A grown-ass man will always demand more from his children than they think they can give. A grown-ass man will always be there when his children fail. A grown-ass man will love unconditionally and teach relentlessly. A grown-ass man will put his feet on the floor each morning and say, I will do better than yesterday. A grown-ass man will never, ever listen to society tell him that men don't matter and that fatherhood is meaningless because a grown-ass man knows that those who have been working tirelessly for a hundred years to tear apart the family will fail in the end. Because a grown-ass man knows that family matters above all. All the rest are nothing more than little boys. Happy Father's Day to those who do the job. With that, I bid you all good day. Now take a moment to reflect upon the miracle that is your existence. Then stand up and get after it. By the way, I have some things in the work for in the works for you all, and uh, I'm writing you a song. I'm composing you a song for uh, for one thing. That's going to be a big surprise coming up soon. Yes, I'm very talented. Auburn stuff can be found at auburnstuff.podbean.com on Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, Google Podcast, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and lots of other places in the podcast universe. Also on YouTube, social media. All that stuff that 
is really tedious for me to deal with. However, I encourage you to download and do your listening on the Podbean app. You can get the alerts, live shows, participate in the production, and uh, have a little fun along the way. You can listen to everything that you listen to on the Podbean app. I don't know anything that's not there. So go out and do that. Um, And let's increase our listenership through across all platforms, really. I want you to drop me a line at uh, auburnstuff at yahoo.com if you uh, if you have anything to contribute. Or you can use that Twitter thing if you're so inclined. Every now and then something will pop up on Instagram. If I photograph something of interest to me and the Auburn family. And remember folks, actively support what you like. Subscribe, rate, review, give, share. Do all those things. Subscribe to the podcast that you love. Like Auburn stuff. Rate it and review it. You guys, I know you've been told this a million times, but it is the most important thing, especially on the uh, Apple podcast platform. Show's going to get buried if you don't support it. So go ahead and do what you know is the right thing and click that five-star review. Click subscribe and leave a rating. I mean, uh, leave a review. One word. Yo. Sup. Dope. Anyway, go ahead and get out there and contribute so that uh, the shows that you love stay where they are. And as always, be mindful, be fit, be authentic. Sometimes it's all you have, but most of the time, it's all you ever need. Until next time, War Eagle, everyone, and see you down the road.